Thank you very much for your friendship and that kind introduction. I'd also like to thank the president of Middlebury, Lori Patton, for her great leadership and what is presently and what in the future will continue to happen. She is extraordinary. I would also like to thank classmate Ted Truscott and his wife Kathy. Ted is a member of the Board of Trustees, a true visionary, and Ted has helped out over the years, especially with Axis of Hope, as someone who has been very, very generous. I'd also like to thank the Middlebury Alumni Association. I'd like to thank specifically Meg Story Groves for all that you've done to set this up absolutely extraordinary and I will never forget your phone call when we chatted about this. I thought you were going to call me about who was going to be able to give a lot of money and I would make those secondary calls and when you said this prize is coming up I couldn't believe it so I thank you very much. I would also like to thank some former professors that changed my life. Mireille Barbeau, Nick Williams, starting in freshman year, taught me not only French grammar, but how to fall in love with French literature. Mireille Barbeau then said, Carl, you've got to go to Paris, junior year abroad. When I got there, I had a duffel bag, didn't know where I was going to stay, but wanted to live with a family. I was in Nancy O'Connor's office when someone called and said, je m'appelle. Madame Blanchard, je cherche un jeune homme comme au père parce que j'ai deux fils. My name is Michel Blanchard. I'm looking for a young man to be an au père because I have two sons. I moved in that same day. In the middle of the Latin Quarter, not far from the Pantheon, they are still my second family in the world to this day because of Middlebury. I also want to thank the late Carol Refelge, an absolutely spectacular woman who was passionate about teaching French. Nancy O'Connor, whom I just mentioned, who also changed my life overseas. Eric Davis, a political science professor who started getting me thinking about not only domestic political science here in the US, but international relations. And John Berninghausen, who's with us today. John Berninghausen and I grew up in Minneapolis. John set up this world-renowned Mandarin Chinese program. And when I got to Belmont Hill School back in 1993, right out of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, I said to the board at Belmont Hill, we need Mandarin and we need it ASAP. Not a lot of other prep schools had it. Two people on the Board of Trustees at Belmont Hill said, we will fund it. One of them, Jonathan Kraft of the Kraft family, son of Bob and Myra. And they said, you're going to take a lot of flack at this very conservative institution for getting Mandarin Chinese on our map. You're going to have to take that flack. That became an absolutely amazing nationally renowned Mandarin program because of the teacher we brought in and because of the man who is sitting in the back right now. I thank you, Professor Berninghausen, fellow Minneapolis person. And finally, today you see a certain name up there who wrote the foreword to my book, Charlie McCormick. Charlie could not be here today Class of 1963, Charlie goes on to become the CEO of Save the Children. I have so many of these ties <laughs> with coffee spots all over them, wearing these around the world when I'm working with children, adolescents, and young adults. Every single one of them designed by a child. This man taught me to take risks, to get out there and work with kids. And I said, John, when I'm out there, I've seen winners in the zip code lottery, and I've seen losers in the zip code lottery. 
overseas and right here in the United States. And he said, you believe in what you're doing, what's called global intelligence quotient, and raising the global intelligence quotient of children, starting when they're young, go for it. Keep taking risks. Keep doing what you do. His forward in this book that came out in 2013 will give you the outline of what is still going on in our world today. Climate issues, domestic and international terrorism, the rise of China, along with Russia, Iran, and North Korea. He called it back then. And we've been collaborating on preventing World War III since then. What do you see there when you look at it? Do you see a beautiful woman turning to the side, or do you see an older woman putting her chin down? Back after 9-11, I was at Belmont Hill School, and I got a call in my office where I was chairing the foreign language department, bringing in Mandarin Chinese, eventually rose to become assistant headmaster. I was being groomed to be a head of school at an Exeter and over St. Paul's. Seven of my colleagues from that school are now heads of school. Milton Academy, Lakeside, out in Seattle, Washington, and the list goes on. After 9-11, that call was from the U.S. Department of State. We understand that you do model UN type exercises with youth, and you've been experimenting with this since 1993 when you left the Fletcher School, at Belmont Hill School, at other prep schools around the country, and with public schools, bringing public and private school students together to focus on global issues, bringing down the barriers of winners and losers in the zip code lottery. And that's worked well, we've heard. You can work with minority kids around the country. I said, yes, I grew up in Minneapolis at the height of busing in the public school system. State Department said, we've got pockets around the country of people who are being recruited to be members of Al-Qaeda, Islamic State, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram. We need help. I started doing these workshops from Fremont, California, outside of San Francisco, to the south side of Chicago, to Harlem, down south. And what was really interesting when I did these conflict resolution-focused case studies is, back to this, something that the State Department and the intelligence community taught me. You have got to move from perception to perspective. You've got to think about what you see and what you believe. Learn to walk in the shoes of others so that you understand their perspective. So to understand this and what my case study allowed me to do, having students role play sides that they didn't agree with, can you imagine being a pro-Israeli student with my Who's Jerusalem case study and I forced students to become members of Fatah Hamas? What did they learn? Perspective. And what I found over the years is moving from perception to perspective did not only work in the U.S., they started sending me overseas. Afghanistan, Rwanda, Iraq, list goes on. Working with kids in these different places, I found that it continued to work, especially when I would bring a case study that was not focused on their particular area. So if I brought the Who's Jerusalem case study to Rwanda, where I got my start, I connected students there with the Palestinian and Israeli students that I had worked with in the Middle East. They were able to talk about how to prevent conflict in Rwanda, what they had learned in the Middle East. And then I left Rwanda using these students as my research assistants to build a case study on post-genocide Rwanda that I could use elsewhere in the world. This began to work like a charm. It created what I call the mafia of kids around the world who in their formative years of life did not just study languages, they studied diplomacy, and they absorbed what I call the vitamin C's to prevent the cancer of conflict.
communication, comprehension, compromise, creativity, collaboration, and hopefully preventing, two more C words, the cancer of conflict that is metastasizing every single day around the world. Nineteen ninety three I graduated from Fletcher. Nineteen ninety four was the height of the genocide in Rwanda. Paul Kagame at that time was a general. He had four kids. He came to the United States shortly after the height of the genocide to look for a prep school for his oldest son, Ivan. He chose Belmont Hill School. I happened to be at Belmont Hill School. He walks into my office and said, I hear you teach conflict resolution. Would you be interested in coming to work in Rwanda post-genocide? And I said, well, isn't it a little dangerous? He said, we'll protect you. I get on a plane, I arrive in Kigali at night, look like candles in the hills all over the place. The fires smelled absolutely amazing. The next day, walking through the streets of Rwanda, I learned something that's really important for students. All of the senses are touched. Can you imagine seeing dead and dying children, hearing screams and barks, tasting salty water that wasn't necessarily good for you. It was all the senses that were stimulated. And there I met Paul Farmer for the first time with Partners in Health. And Ophelia Dahl, co-founder of Partners in Health, whose father was Roald Dahl of James and the Giant Peach and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and Jim Kim. Jim, who went on to become the president of Dartmouth and then the head of the World Bank. They were there working on medical reform. And unfortunately, in this past year, Paul passed away in that hospital that he oversaw the construction of. I was there to work on education reform. Not only working on language acquisition, President Kagame asked me to set up a national Mandarin program because he wanted better relations with China. And he wanted me to set up an Arabic program because of the relationship he was setting up with Saudi Arabia. And then I also set up a national Mandarin and, and Arabic program as well as this conflict resolution program where I was teaching kids, Hutus and Tutsis, how to finally start to get along. And if you look at this map, I lived in Kigali right in the center, went back and forth to Boston. My last two year stint there, working for the Department of State and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Education in Rwanda, was between 2016 and the end of 2018. When I first got there years ago, this is what I saw. Those are what's called interahamwe. The Hutu radicals that picked up sticks, got guns, or used machetes that they usually use on the land to slice up Tutsis and moderate Hutus who hid the Tutsis or married them. Intehahamwe called them cockroaches. Look what a machete can do just to bring a person down and allow that person to get out of the way and no longer fight. And look at this little boy. Can you imagine smelling and seeing and tasting and hearing all of what was left behind after the genocide? When Madeleine Albright was our ambassador to the United Nations and she chose not to send more UN forces? The United States 
in 1994 was in the middle of an election year. The focus was here in the U.S. It wasn't strategic enough to send forces to Rwanda. It wasn't on the Strait of Gibraltar near the Suez Canal. Rwanda didn't need American forces. It wasn't important to us. I began to learn about U.S. foreign policy and what it could do and what it couldn't do because of politics. Kagame's military guys took me to the border of the Democratic Republic of Congo, where at the end of the 100 days of genocide in 1994, early July, Hutus, especially Hutu radicals, were allowed by the French forces to get the people out and into the Democratic Republic of Congo. Hutu power, which was the extremists who were killing all the Rwandans, over 800,000 in 100 days. Hutu power led the charge because of Operation Turquoise, where the French opened up the passageway to allow them to leave. So imagine what I face today, not only working with Hutu power back then when they just got over the border on conflict management and prevention, but now Hutu power is called FDLR, and they're getting even more radical, and they're right over the border in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and their friends who are giving them funding and are also a presence there, Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, and Islamic State. And you know why State Department keeps calling up and the intelligence community? Carl, you know how to work with kids. You believe in children in their formative years of life. You believe in saving children. You have seen so much death of children, you smelled it. We need you over there to keep them calm. And what I've learned is, when you move in there to keep things calm, and the U.S. decides we're pulling out, when you do, drones can come in. Forces, in this case in Rwanda, that we support can come in and wipe out all the kids. So I can tell you, I've seen a lot of death and destruction. And Paul Farmer taught me, you can either go crazy, get into drugs, get into alcohol, come back to the United States and see a psychiatrist every week, or you can become a zealot and continue to do what you believe in to save more kids around the world. So Paul Kagame, right here when he was in the military, was my first experiment with this. Again, setting up the Mandarin Chinese program, the Arabic program, and the conflict resolution program. That's Hotel Rwanda today. And Paul Rusasa Begina, the famous manager of Hotel Rwanda, who lived in Texas, was making so much money off this movie and the books that he wrote and his speaking engagements, he was funneling that money back to FDLR former Hutu power that committed the genocide that was in the Democratic Republic of Congo. What does Paul Kagame do? Snatches him in Abu Dhabi. He was in prison there for three years. We just brokered a deal recently, along with the U.S. ambassador in Rwanda, secretly behind the scenes to finally set this guy free. I was involved in the negotiations. It was not easy. You know what President Kagame said? And I've known him for over 20 years. If I let this guy go, Carl, what do you think my conservative inner sanctum is going to think about me? You've got to not worry about your own enemies only. You've got to worry about your best friends who may think you're selling out. Imagine being in that sort of scenario where you start to understand all sides. Back to perception versus perspective. There's Rwanda's flag today. Here is what they're proud of, totally reconstructing that country. 
since 1994. And here is a great photo of the family. On the left, Ivan Kagami, who came to Belmont Hill School. I'll never forget, I had made the move to Boston University in 2008 to direct the Global Literacy Institute there and continue to work on case studies that we could use around the world. 2008, I get a call from President Kagami. I'd like you to write my son a letter of recommendation for college. I said, great, where is he going? He said, please don't tell anybody, but he's going to West Point. I said, that's US taxpayer money. He said, we've worked out a deal with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I knew Israel had, but Rwanda was next to step up because Israel, in its history, had experienced genocide. So had President Kagame. He made the pitch to the United States government. His son was the first one to go there. And then you see next to him, President Paul Kagame. Next to him, the new son-in-law, taller than anybody, who just married Ange not long ago, the only girl in the family. Ange attended Dana Hall School in Wellesley, Massachusetts, so I was her surrogate father in the Boston area when she was there. Ange went on to attend Smith College, where I've got a daughter right now. Next to them is Jeanette Kagami, the first lady, who has been a dear friend for years. She grew up in Burundi during the genocide. President Kagame grew up in Uganda. He doesn't speak French, she does. So you know how she puts me in a pickle when we're together? She speaks French to me and says, you've got to do the translation for my husband. And some of the things she says are not very nice. <laughs> to the right, you see Ian and Brian. They both attended Deerfield Academy and then went on to Williams College. I tried my best. But they ended up going to Williams. This is the family. Notice how well-dressed they are. All of them can no longer say Hutu or Tutsi. It is illegal. They are all Rwandan. But if you think about Tutsis who are tall, fair-skinned, they're the ones that were being killed off during the genocide, guess what their bloodlines are? And guess who the daughter was allowed to marry? I think you get it now. The Tutsi control and the Hutu undercurrent is still a major problem there. And if you think about Hutu power in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where also Al-Qaeda is based and Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab, can you imagine all the seed planting that's going on there? in Eastern Europe. This is where I find myself loving the work. Out in the field, just like Paul Farmer. Wearing jeans, getting a scruff beard, wearing a t-shirt full of holes, connecting with kids as a mazungu. What the heck are you doing here? You believe in this. Once you make that connection with kids in their formative years of life, you teach them conflict resolution by having them play different roles. And then I take them to orphanages to work with children. One run by Mother Teresa's Missionaries of Charity in the heart of Kigali, home of hope. There, kids like the members of the Kagami family, former Hutus, or former Tutsis, former Hutus, and now American students that I take over there work together on conflict resolution and then they go together to the orphanage to do service learning. Can you imagine those three different types of students working together, connecting technologically, and able to become leaders who know one another starting in their formative years of life? And Rwanda was my start. This is now happening all over the world. And what we do is a very basic concept. 
is called triangulation. So you've probably heard of game theory and prisoner's dilemma. Game theory and prisoner's dilemma taught me a lot about how to role play, forcing people into different roles. My theory, create six different role play groups. So when I first went to Rwanda, one and two were both Palestinian groups based on my Who's Jerusalem case study. So one was Fatah, two was the political wing of Hamas. Three and four, Likud and Labor, both Israeli. Five and six, five was the United Nations, and six was the Arab League. And see the bullseye? That's three issues that the students have to study. Bullseye one is always focused on military. We've just updated it. We are thinking that the third intifada is gonna take place. How do we prevent that? Number two is economic form, reform or letter B. And letter C has to do with political reform and creating a democracy so Palestinians and Israelis can get along. And you know what I do? I force kids into roles that they might not be comfortable with. So they have to act out the roles of these people so they understand what's going on in their minds. And as a football coach for over 30 years, I say it's like watching films of the other team, understanding every single player you're gonna get, be up against. Exactly what Tom Brady does before every game. He even gets to memorize the names of the people on defense. So when they hit him, Andy, great hit. How are the boys doing? Think about the second time he gets tackled. It's just not gonna be the same because Goat knows this guy. Same thing with forcing students to walk in the shoes of others. And when they're arguing, what I have them do is this. Those six groups at six different tables, imagine them in a gymnasium. They have to split off and come up with as individual groups times six their opening summary statement about their stances on the three points. And then I pair them up and we need five rounds of negotiations for each group to meet with another individually. And what I teach them is what Roger Fisher and Bill Urey taught me, BATNA, best alternative to a negotiated agreement. I also teach them how to separate the people from the problem. I teach them about mutual gains. I teach them how to be active listeners. And I teach them how to mirror or mimic something we do when we're investigating things going on in other countries where you need interrogators, myself being one of them. In interrogation, anytime you're talking to someone, you always repeat the last three to four words of every sentence of the person to show you are listening and hearing and respecting. Or as I often say, if you think about it, the word listen, spelled another way is silent. Spelled a third way is enlist. So by listening and remaining silent during interrogations or during role plays, you are showing the other side respect and you're getting more compassion out of them by always being the second speaker, never the first. So you go to pre-negotiation team meetings, as I just said, you go through all the rounds of negotiations. And the last one, instead of having three pairs of groups meeting, those three pods become the three issue tables. So you're totally flip-flopping one against another so they're all focused on one of the three issues. You get six different parties at each table. So now you've got more creativity, more ideas at the table, and you've got one sixth of the voice, no longer 50% of the voice. This triangulation theory has taken off throughout the world. Not only with geopolitical conflicts, businesses use this. Can you imagine the role play scenario of executives, CEO and chair of the board overlap? 
head of the union and manager of one of the stores, call your shots here. You can do anything with six and three. And then you can create subgroups too. Those three lines of the triangle, you can put little circles there for other parties. See the bullseye? You can put circle five, six, seven, you can put as many as you want. But you try and stick with, in the initial phases, six and three. And I talked about doing these conflict resolution exercises in the US, taking students there and doing things in Rwanda and elsewhere around the world. That service learning piece based on John Dewey is so important because you take the kids together to work with disadvantaged younger kids. Mother Teresa Orphanage called Home of Hope in Rwanda. I've been working there since I first went over years ago. The man on the right, Stu Symington, an incredible mentor who is a career state and CIA official who was ambassador to Rwanda. Stu went on to Nigeria to be our ambassador. He's now back in the United States. But he's the one that's counseled me about perception perspective when working with kids. And imagine the kids working in an orphanage with kids who are HIV positive or have yellow fever or have cholera. And imagine you're sitting on a long bench and you've got a crib right in front of you. And the poles in the crib are made of metal. They're not made of wood. And you've got several kids from Rwanda and the United States there feeding these kids porridge with two hands. I was with an American student on one side and a, pal and a uh, student from Rwanda on the other side. I'll never forget the American student looking over to the other student and saying, oh my God, you know what I just thought of? It's like a prison cell. These kids are prisoners of poverty. I said, yep, they're losers in the zip code lottery. This has such an impact on kids who go, stimulating all the senses, no longer reading about it out of a book or connecting via the internet. You start that way, role play in the US, connect them via Skype, Zoom, but then you get them there. You know what I call that? Lok Nation Obel. Start locally, then go national, then go global. And when I'm, I'm teaching conflict resolution at Boston University or this fall starting at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, man, did they come up with a nice deal to set up a think tank there. I said, it's Loke Nationobel in terms of service learning. And then you flip flop that term in terms of studying conflict resolution. Start with a conflict far away global, then bring it closer to home, national, border control, gun control. We've got all these national case studies. And then we write them on local issues, things that are going on in Boston, New York City, glow, national, local. So you're giving kids the John Dewey Montessori experiential education in conflict resolution, language acquisition, and getting to work with leaders in their formative years of life and never losing touch. Our lives come to an end when we become silent about things that matter. Listen, silent, enlist, inlets, those same letters, form inlets where your boat can pull in in an area of peace to work with your adversaries, spelled a fifth way, tinsel. This is the final piece on the Christmas tree that sparkles with hope. I've worked in so many places around the world where I've lost so many kids. That's only a small list of tattooed hope, including 
Arabic. Going in there, working with kids face to face, smelling and seeing and hearing the conflict, trying to solve problems. I got a call in 2011, January. Carl, God, we need help quickly. Could you come over to Jalalabad and do your same conflict resolution work? We've got all these kids in Jalalabad that are being recruited by Taliban. And there are still remnants of Mujahideen. I did a risk analysis. I'm like, wait a minute. That's way outside the green zone in the capital, the protected zone. It's a big risk. What do you need me there for? Oh, you're good with kids. I find out, after not going, those two $60 million helicopters that flew in secretly to pick off Osama bin Laden, stopped in Jalalabad, went and got him, lost one. One picked his body up with all the SEALs who were there fit into one of these helicopters, and they took off to sea where they identified Osama bin Laden and put his body into the water. What was I to go there for? Calm things down before the U.S. moved in. You know what happened to Jalalabad after we left? All these kids got killed because they hadn't joined the Taliban or Mujahideen. Welcome to my belief in working with children and saving children around the world and oftentimes U.S. foreign policy, which changes every two and four years. So finally, please think about the triangulation. Please think about the triangulation. Anytime you've got a problem at work, at home, think about six sides, walking in the shoes of all six sides, think about three issues. You can't decide on the bullseye or the most important one, move on to the second and the third one and revisit. This case study approach to conflict resolution works around the world. I've now got two interns this summer, one from West Point, a young woman who is majoring in international relations in Russian. She is already being picked up by the Central Intelligence Agency. She is kicking out case studies like this, one right now that she's collaborating on with a guy who just graduated from Georgetown, my second intern. We've got one in Ukraine, Russia. Can you imagine one, two, three, four, five, six? Tony Blinken, number one. Two, foreign minister of Ukraine. Three, foreign minister of Russia. Four, foreign minister of China. Five and six, foreign minister of the state of Georgia, not far away from Ukraine, and the foreign minister of Turkey. The three issues, and we floated this case study and it's being used around the world. A, the threat of a nuclear disaster. As Russia moves its short-range nuclear missiles into Belarus, they also have the, uh, it is called the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, one of four nuclear power plants in Ukraine, the largest one. You know what they've done? It's not only a military facility, nobody's going to attack it because of the nuclear reactors. They have booby-trapped all of the nuclear reactors, and you might have seen recently on, on the news, they have bombed the dam that provides the cooling water for those reactors. Oh, and you know what else happened? As the water opens up, there are over 90,000 landmines that are now floating. Anytime those come up against something solid, they blow up. Welcome to conflict. Welcome to kids dying. And when you see it, and you smell it, and you hear it, as I said before, you either go crazy or you keep saving more kids. And you teach kids about it here in the United States. So A is the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which could be a nuclear disaster like Chernobyl or well beyond. Especially with the wind pattern going into Western Europe, which, like what happened in Chernobyl. Letter B, the four provinces of eastern Ukraine. Who's going to govern them? Who's going to run them? You go two and two, 
Ukraine, Russia? Do you have co-directors, co-governors of those regions? There's no right answer. And C, grain exports. Russia is choking grain exports out of Ukraine to third world countries. Putin is close to starving a lot of those nations. So can you imagine having middle school students and high school students arguing this stuff around the world? And we're cranking these out in multiple languages too so that students are using their language skills. Because diplomats, when you get out there, you have the language skills of the people you're working with, your respect goes right through the roof. I'd like to leave you with this, the challenge and the vision. Think about that. $25 million gift to this great college for the Catherine Wasserman Davis Collaborative in Conflict Transformation. I got news of this from Craig Stewart, class of 1963, who has been a dear friend and mentor, Charlie McCormick's roommate here. Craig, right out of Middlebury College, got into the intelligence community. He was an operative working in Korea. Got out, came and got into the prep school world here in the US, first in New Jersey, then he went out to Seattle, where he was director of development at Lakeside School. Bill Gates, Bill Gates graduated from there, so did Paul Allen of Microsoft. Bill Gates' children went there. Jeff Bezos' kids all go there. So he was director of development out there. He called me when he heard that the US government had been knocking on the door after 9-11. He said, you're about to make the opposite transition that I made, going from working for the intelligence community to working in the prep school world, you were being groomed to be a headmaster, now you're going to, excuse me, to help out the United States. Those two members of the class of 1963 have had my back the whole time through this. And what I'd like to propose here do you see in the second paragraph how at the end it says, where students learn and practice different approaches to conflict management and resolution? Remember I said conflict is like a cancer that's constantly metastasizing? How about if we add there, right before management, conflict prevention? Working with kids in their formative years of life to try and prevent cancer more effectively the cancer of conflict. And I propose this too. Middlebury has always dealt with undergrads and graduate students and are now, Middlebury is now working with high school students around the country with its summer language programs. I would like to propose to Middlebury College exactly what John Dewey did out at the University of Chicago. Create a lab school, a Middlebury, lab school, where we are working with kids starting in nursery school, and we come up with a model where our graduate students and our undergrads are trickling down and helping with the high school, the middle school, the elementary school, and we are starting to teach kids critical languages, Arabic, Urdu, Farsi, Punjabi, Mandarin, Russian, Korean. We're teaching them conflict resolution skills through triangulation. We're teaching them STEM. I just wrote an op-ed about cybersecurity. We need a K-12 cybersecurity program in this country like Israel's got. All of those things. And Middlebury could be the place to found that. We've got the power. We're spread horizontally around the world now. Let's drill into the granite down to nursery school and kindergarten and start working with children so they grow up during their formative years with the skills to learn foreign languages and to become what I call chameleons who can fit in in other societies around the world. And instead of isolating themselves, know that they're global citizens and that they're able to raise their global intelligence quotient. And not only academically, 
once we do this, this not only helps out corporations and the U.S. military, but it helps out our intelligence community. As you can tell, I'm passionate about this. And I've seen way too many kids die. Middlebury holds the key under an incredible president. And I ask you all to think about your own children and your own grandchildren moving away from monolingualism and monoculturalism to trying to do more to help out the shrinking planet. Thanks very much.